Good morning everyone. Today I'm going to show you one of the new plugins in Foreman 1.2 which enables a new piece of functionality that may be useful to many of you. It's around the idea of Metal as a Service. Uh, to recap, that's where you want to consume your hardware in a similar way to virtual machines where you want to not care too much about specifics of MAC addresses, rack locations, network configuration. As a user you just want to have a new machine configured with your OS of choice. And this is useful in a number of places. It's useful when you get a delivery of 20 new servers from your hardware vendor or when you're managing a small lab in which actual machines are being reinstalled. There's a number of places in, in which this can be useful. So we've written a plugin for this. Uh, it's not part of the default form and install. It is a plugin, but it's very easy to enable and configure. So I'm going to walk you through how to do that. It's going to take us about 10 minutes. Um, once we've got that, we can then boot some machines and see how it actually works. So I'm going to go ahead and log into my development instance of Foreman. Obviously this is running the very latest version of the development code, but it looks very similar in Foreman 1.2. <clears throat> so this is just my standard form and install. Um, things are useful, things are what we expect, it's exactly what you'd look like. The thing I'm going to draw your attention to is just the links we expect here, so compute resources, domains, hardware, etc. This is all as we expect it. That's because I've not enabled the plugin yet. So let's do that. Enabling plugins in, in 1.2 is uh, a command line task, there's no UI for it yet, but it's very easy. All we have to do is create a file in bundler.d. We can call it anything we like. So I'm going to call it plugins.rb. And we just need to put a line in here. So gem foreman discovery. So what that will do is it updates bundler to say you need to get this gem. And it obviously comes from Ruby gems, just like every other gem. Um, and then of course we run bundle update. So this is going to um, go and fetch the latest version of the Foreman gem, Foreman Discovery gem, from RubyGems. So we've published an RC candidate of Foreman Discovery plugin to RubyGems so it can just be downloaded. As it's a bundler command, we can of course use from Git, from a local path, whatever, but in this case we're publishing the gems, so it's easy. If we just scroll up a little bit, we should see, yes, there it is. So. Obviously in your case it might say installing, in my case I've been developing it so the gem is already present, it's just saying using, but we get some information that says it's now using the gem. Of course we've changed things on the disk so we need to restart Rails. Okay, so we have restarted Rails, let's go back and refresh our host page. So it looks much the same. The only real difference we have is this extra link here under provisioning. We have discovered hosts. So let's go ahead and click on that. Unsurprisingly, we have no discovered hosts yet because we haven't booted any. There's nothing to show. So we need to do some configuration to make the plugin work. And if you think about it, the most important thing we need to do is to deal with how the Pixie Boot net network setup works. What we're basically saying is any machine that boots on the network that I don't know about needs to report to form. Now the way to do that is to use a RAM disk, uh, a little bootable image that can be delivered over PXE uh, that the machines can boot up and use to fire information to form. So there's two steps to this. First we need to configure our templates and then we need to actually build the image. So let's have a look at our templates. So by default, in Foreman, you will have two files. This is true of Foreman 1.1 and up. You will have a Pixie default and a Pixie local boot. And by default, they will be exactly the same content. They will both contain this information, which basically says boot from your disk. So an unknown machine will boot up and it will get the pxc.cfg slash default file, which will have the contents of this template and this template just says boot from your disk. I don't know who you are, so boot from your disk. We need to change this. We need to make this file say, I don't know who you are, so boot from this image that I'm going to give you. 
So to do that we need to change the template. And I'm just going to cut and paste from a file I have handy. And it seems to have included my tab stops. So, what are we seeing here? This looks quite similar. The first bit is quite similar because all we're doing is setting a default. But the main entry in the file has changed substantially. And there's a couple of things we really need to look at. Um, the first thing is obviously we're, we're passing a new kernel in now. And we've got some extra spaces as well. So we're passing in this new kernel. Um, which we're going to have to get from somewhere, and we're passing in this init RD, which we're going to have to get from somewhere as well. Uh, and we'll come to that in just a moment. We're also passing an option on the kernel command line called foreman.ip. This is how I'm telling the bootable image where my foreman server is. Um, in this case, I'm using an IP address uh, because I don't have DNS on my private network. But if you do have DNS, you can replace this. You can use foreman.server equals my foreman something like that, uh, myforman.company.com, whatever. It will, if you use foreman.server, it will do a DNS lookup. If it finds a record, it will use it. If you use an IP address, obviously it will use the IP address direct. Um, and if you specify neither, it will use a DNS record of foreman. This might be useful if you're going to boot this image from, say, USB or something like that, where you can't so easily specify uh, kernel command line parameters. But mostly you can specify exactly where your foreman server is. One thing to note is that you can't specify a port when using foreman.server because it's a DNS lookup. So if you do need to specify a port, you'll need to specify it with an IP address. So we can save this. This is great. This will do the job, and we can deploy that, obviously, to our Pixie server. There we go. But we still need to actually build the image. We need to get this TFTP image from somewhere. There's two ways to do this. You can build it yourself, um, and there's a rake task for it. So if we come back here and we do something like bundle exec rake minus t, so rake minus t lists all of the rake tasks, if you don't know that. Um, we have this new task, rake discovery, build image. So that will build a local copy of the bootable image for you on your local machine. Um, it will. It's based on Tiny Core Linux. It will download the Tiny Core Linux, Linux ISO, unpack it, modify it, repack it, and spit it out ready for you to use. It takes quite a while. Um, so I've run it already, and you can see the output here. So let's just walk through this. I've run it with mode equals prod. Why? Because there are different network requirements for different people, the image comes with two flavors. By default, it uses mode equals debug, in which you automatically get a shell when the system boots up, and it starts SSH so that you can log into it from the network. This is very useful when you're testing and developing discovery-related stuff. Uh, particularly if you're trying to add new custom facts or something like that. Once you've got an image you're happy with, you don't really want to leave unlocked shells or um, easily accessed SSH daemons running on your hardware. Um, that's a security vulnerability. So mode equals prod disables all of that. There is no login, no user account, no SSH. The system is locked down. The only thing that can talk to it is fallen over the REST API. So, I've gone for a prod image here just to show you how that looks. You're welcome to use a debug image if you prefer. So we've built it. You can see there's some output. We've got the discovery image. It says it's in discovery image. We can have a look in there. You can see we get the two files that we were expecting to see. And now we can copy them, right? So um, I can copy VM Linux to tiny core VM Linux. I can copy initrd to tiny core initrd. And if we cat the file we just wrote, tftp, .cfg default, you can see that these files match. We've got uh, boot tiny core VM Linux, boot tiny core VM Linux, and boot initrd, boot initrd. So we've put the files in place that the template requires. If you don't want to build the image yourself, or if for some reason the rake task has a problem for you, and if it does, please let us know and we'll fix it. 
But if for some reason you have trouble building the image yourself, you can get them. Um, they're available at deb.theforman.org. And you'll see there's a discovery image prod folder and a discovery image debug folder which contains the images. So you can just download them and use them if that's useful to you. So let's recap. We've modified the templates, we've set up the image, we're ready to go. Before I boot, I'll make one last point. Because the IP address is specified in the template, the images are actually network agnostic. They will work on any network. You can use the same image in multiple places. There's nothing embedded in them that's specific to your network. If you do want to embed more files in it, there's documentation about adding custom facts and things like that. So let's recap. We've got a bootable image, we've got templates. We're now capable of actually trying to discover some hardware. So let's have a go at that. Here we have my rack of hardware. Obviously I can't have a real rack of hardware, it's difficult to show you that in the video. So what we've got here is a set of virtual machines. These virtual machines have been created outside of Foreman. It doesn't know anything about them. We're going to boot them up, we're going to see what happens. So I'm going to turn them on. Hopefully it won't slow my laptop down too much. And I've just kept this last one on the console so that you can see what happens. So it boots up. It comes into the default uh, menu that we were looking for. I'm not going to interfere with it. I want to see, show you what happens when you don't touch it. So it's obviously got a timeout. That's just there in case you need to do something with it. Obviously, it's your template. You can bring that timeout down to like two seconds or something if you don't really care. And now it's booting up. So we've got the box. It's got a login prompt, but because we built a prod image, there's no account. There's no way to log into the system. There's nothing that you can do to get into it. Um, it doesn't run SSH. It doesn't have a login. There's no passwords. The only thing it really talks to is the REST API that Fallen will use to communicate with it. And here it goes. It's setting that up now. So you can see it starts the Fallen proxy. You'll be familiar with the Fallen proxy from other parts of the Fallen code base. Um, we use it here in order to just to get a consistent REST API and because it already has some code in it that we want to use, like being able to query facts off a system, so it made sense to reuse it. We also extend it, as you'll see in a bit, in order to be able to reboot the system, which becomes very important. So all five systems are now up. Let's have a look at our discovered host page. So I'm going to refresh this. And here we go. We've now got all five discovered hosts, which is superb. So we've turned on some hardware. Literally, that's all we've done, turned it on. And as so long as it's on the right network, i.e. the one that's being served this netboot image, we get them discovered into form, which is lovely. But that's not the end of the story. We actually want to provision these machines. So let's say I'm building a new web server, and I need a machine that's got a gig of memory. I gave one of these VMs a gig of memory. So let's see if we can find it. So this data is all searchable. We know information about the discovered host. We get, we collect their facts. We know things about them. In fact, I'll show you that first. So if I come in here, we can see things like, ignore the architecture because it's a 32-bit bootable image, so it always reports as 32-bit. Um, but we get the IP address, we get MAC address, we get memory, we get um, the type of CPUs, the type of hardware the unique ID, serial numbers, etc. All the facts that you'd expect to see from your system are here. Um, and you can extend that with custom facts if it's important to your system. So we can search on this. We can try and find the machine we're looking for. So I can come up here and I can say something like, I'm looking for um, facts.memory memory size megabytes equals 1,000. And there we go, we found the VM we're looking for. We found the one VM that's got more memory than all the others, so we can provision this. We can say, okay, I found a machine that meets my requirements. So I can press this provision button. And what happens now is I get dropped directly into a very familiar page. It's the host edit page. So what we're really doing is we're taking this host and we're filling out all the other information that's needed to make it into a fully fledged form and host. So at the moment, the only thing we really know about it is its MAC address and its IP address. And where is it? 
Um, but I can change this, right? So we said we were making a web server, so let's call it web server. Um, ah, let's, we might make more than one, let's call it web server one. I can give it a host group, and just like with a new host, when you select a host group, it fills in all of the other defaults. So you get the environment, you get the puppet master, you get network. So the network tab is already filled out because we already know the MAC address and the IP address. Obviously, I can change this, but I'm happy with the defaults. Um, I've got an operating system, I've got parameters, all the stuff you would expect, right? So when I press submit, what's going to happen is that REST API that's running on the discovered host is listening for commands from Foreman. When I press submit, it will be told to reboot. So if I press that, let it save. So we get dropped into a normal host page. This has now been saved as a standard Foreman host. And if we look here, we can hopefully see Discovery 3 has started doing some work. So this must be the one that's got more memory than all the others. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close down number 5 and open up number 3. And you can see we're already in the Debian installer. So it's been told to reboot. And now that it has rebooted, it's gone straight into the Debian installer because obviously Foreman's written a TFTP file for its specific MAC address. So it no longer boots into the RAM disk image, instead it boots into the Debian installer. And of course, when it's done, it will reboot again, but now it will have a file for its specific MAC address which says boot from your local disk. So we'll let that carry on. On the Foreman side, we've now got a host. Um, we can do all the normal things we would expect to do with a host. It shows up in our host list. And of course, as you would expect, it's no longer in the discovered hosts list. There's only four hosts here now. Um, obviously, should we ever want... Now, you've got two ways of managing the system at this point, right? You can either treat it like a normal host from here on out. You know its MAC address. You know what it's got. You can just say, here's a new operating system, reinstall, just like you would with any form and host. Or, if it's more of a self-service portal type idea, maybe a hardware lab or something like that, you could just delete it from Foreman and then reboot it, and it'll come back up into the discovery pool ready for another user to come along and specify an, an OS for it. So that's everything that I wanted to show you. We've, we've installed the plugin, we've created an image, we've sorted out our templates, and we've discovered some hardware and we've provisioned it. One thing you should know, um, or rather a number of things you should know. Um, firstly, it has to be done as admin at the moment. There are permissions to uh, do this as a, a non-admin user, but they don't work quite right, and we're not sadly going to be able to fix it in time for Form 1.2. Hopefully by Foreman 1.3 we can work around the problem and you'll be able to do this as a non-admin user, but that's one of the, the downsides. The other downside is that at the moment Foreman itself only supports the concept of a global default file. It writes the same pxc.cfg slash default to every one of your TFTP servers. If that's not suitable to you, if you want to do discovery only on one network, that's fine. Um, but you will need to manually change that template because if you don't, Formal will write it to all of your subnets, which isn't necessarily what you want. Um, a third thing that you should be aware of is that because Foreman sends a command to the node, it needs to be able to reach the node, which for the moment pretty much means they have to be on the same network because Foreman will boot, well, Foreman will take the IP address of the machine that logs in and then use it to communicate with that machine thereafter. So if they're not on the same network, Foreman won't be able to talk to it. That's everything. Um, looking forward to your feedback. Um, contact us in the usual places, the mailing lists, IRC, all that kind of place. Uh, the plugin itself is available on GitHub, uh, the Foreman slash Foreman underscore discovery. And um, I welcome all PRs and contributions. Thanks very much, guys.